that's not happened yet. There it is. At least it popped up on my screen. And um, so just want to remind folks to be very uh, thoughtful about what you're sharing in, in the way of protected health information, PHI, that uh, gives information about your specific situation or may identify you as a recipient, family member, et cetera. So please be thoughtful about that as this is being recorded. Um, next slide, please. Thanks. We, um, and by the way, back on the first slide, we, we did have uh, links for looking at the slides, getting various pieces of information where the web page is. We uh, have a large group here. I'm looking at, oh my gosh, 106 people. And uh, we have a certain amount of time and a certain amount of things to get through. So there are points in the meeting where I will, my task will be to initiate what we call the speaker's queue and where I take names for uh, people to get into the queue to make verbal comments. So you can put comments in the chat, questions, comments in the chat that will end up in the listening log. Uh, but if you want to get into the queue to speak out loud, you can do it one of three ways. You can go down to the reactions button at the bottom of your screen in the webinar, click that. It will open up a little pop-up where you can raise your hand, or if you change your mind to lower your hand. There's that. You can type into the chat. Uh, for example, I would type John for the Q, and you can just use the letter Q as an acronym. Uh, I will at times be calling for people to unmute their phones who are on the phone only if you're not in the webinar. To give me your name to join that queue. But if you are online at all, if you can please use the raised hand or the chat itself to type your name in. And I will be doing my very best to take those in order. As the meeting proceeds, I may, I probably will be going if there's someone who hasn't spoken yet to make sure that we hear from as wide a group of people as possible. So that may take us out of order in that sense, but simply to hear from more people. Also, I will be doing the two minute limit thing today. And that is where I will bring you into the queue, say, okay, please go ahead, Mary. And then you have two minutes and I will then give a heads up when you have 15 seconds left. And I ask people to really abide by that. And if as much as you can keep it to one question at a time, rather than a series of questions, especially if we have a lot of other people in the queue. So, um, Next slide, please. I went over a lot more than was on that slide, but so um, anyway, some of this I've already talked about. Uh, we are doing the queue. Um, please wait till I call on you. If I ask for names, that's not the moment to give your comment, but just to give your name. And again, we are using the listening log as we've talked about, the team has talked about in so many meetings. Next slide, please. So again, two minutes, uh, listening log. And there may be times when I do have to call time so that we can move forward, even if we have people remaining in the queue. And I will do that as uh, diplomatically as I can and understanding that we do wanna hear from you. If that does happen, you can always put things into the chat where they will be memorialized through the listening log. And I would just say that these are important issues these are um, quality of life issues for stakeholders. We get that, so uh, emotions can run high. We do ask people to please be mindful of uh, keeping a professional and courteous atmosphere here. If things deviate from that, I do, which I haven't yet in this series so far, but would need to stop the action and ask people to redirect. So thank you. Next slide, please. And here's today's agenda. Um, and I will turn it over to Tiffany to see if I've missed anything and to go over the agenda. All right, good morning, everyone. I am Tiffany Domikos. I'm the Case Management Redesign Policy Advisor, if we have not met. Um, today's agenda, we will go over some um, basics of kind of how we run the meetings um, and then what you'll see today in our rule review. And then we'll get into the rule review from 9.15 to 10.45, and we'll do our wrap-up 10.45 to 11. Next slide, please. The purpose of these meetings is really to share our um, 
draft rules with stakeholders and to gather feedback. They are about the rules and the structure. We're not here to talk about specific policies, although um, when and if those are brought up, those are still um, logged and recorded. And then anything that warrants further discussion, um, or perhaps we have other meetings about that particular topic, then we would log that in the issues for further discussion and, um, and cite the date and times of those particular meetings for follow-up. Next slide, please. A basic overview of our rule process for, for any new players that we might have here today. So first, subject matter experts draft up new rule structure and make updates. Currently, we are making updates to align with case management redesign um, and to simplify our rule process or our, our rules as they are. Um, and then we bring those healthcare policy and financing staff, bring those drafted rules to stakeholders for review, subject matter experts and healthcare policy and financing leadership um, work to incorporate the approved updates uh, from these meetings. And then our case management redesign team will be sending these rule drafts um, for approval through program integrity, through our leadership, budget, legal, um, a myriad of other folks in our e-clearance process. And then we will have a final draft to send to the Medical Services Board. Next slide, please. Medical Services Board is really the group that reviews and approves all of our rules. So um, there's a, a portion of that process that requires stakeholder feedback or public comment. Um, the Office of Community Living wants to make sure that we are incorporating as much uh, member and advocate and agency feedback as we possibly can. Uh, we know that that we are not the only experts in this field, and so wanting to bring that to this group to uh, to provide that feedback. So, because this rule process um, is so big and this revision is so um, kind of far reaching, we are going to do a little bit of a different process. Uh, so we'll be meeting with the Medical Services Board in advance of our first hearing um, or first reading to prepare and sort of orient them to the content and to resources that will be provided uh, publicly, but also to that particular board. And then the final drafts will go to our um, Medical Services Board coordinator. Um, those folks post um, for public com comment and then it'll be sent to the Attorney General's office for a formal review. Uh, last but certainly not least, we will present to the Medical Services Board. Uh, we'll answer any questions. Um, I believe we have two readings uh, scheduled at this point, um, and then we will hopefully get our approval. Uh, we are hoping for rules to be in effect by January 2024. Next slide, please. So our overall timeline, we have been working on these rules since October 2022 with stakeholders and will conclude in June of 23. Uh, we'll submit our final drafts uh, in September of this year and then do our initial prep meeting with the Medical Services Board in September. We'll open for public comment in October and then our uh, Medical Services Board hearing in November. And then again, final rule adoption in January. Next slide, please. So a little about why we're here, why we're doing this big rule revamp. Uh, so currently our rule structure is pretty fragmented. We have pieces of different programs kind of all over our rules, referencing back and forth. There's not kind of an easy flow. And that's just from years of working in the rules, making updates. And so with case management redesign, we thought this was a good opportunity to streamline the, the rules, um, make it more clean and easy to read and follow for our new agencies. And so um, uh, we had a contractor support us in coming up with a new structure and our leadership signed off on that. Next slide, please. So what you'll see now is um, we will start our rules for home and community-based services with member rights and responsibilities. Then we'll have sections for the waiver and program overall requirements. Next will be case management agency and case manager requirements. 
and then community center board requirements. And then um, where we're at today, you can see we're, we're, we're almost at the finish line here. Uh, we have our provider requirements and then our service definitions. Next slide, please. So through this process, we're really going to, or hoping to reduce the duplication of um, any of the rules, remove areas of the rules that may be obsolete, maybe are not applicable anymore, uh, both to case management and to our services and waivers. Uh, we're hoping to clarify, you know, case management provider and member roles and responsibilities and really put all of that into a structure that's easy to follow and easy to understand. Next slide, please. So there is a difference between, you know, rule structure and versus specific changes. And um, so the restructure really moves the rules around to be in a more accessible format and perhaps with some um, minor language changes that are outdated or don't reflect current practices. Changes um, are things like new statute requirements. Um, they might require a budget ask or a, um, a need to go to get you know, leadership approval on something. And so these meetings that we're doing right now are really to help department staff be informed about that restructure process. Any changes will be highlighted and Nicolette will go over that. Um, and so those are the pieces that we're really looking for that, for that feedback on. We're asking the questions of, you know, is this a logical place for this to land? Is any of this language outdated? Are there any errors? Is there better plain language that can be used? Um, what, what we don't have, have um, capacity for in these particular meetings is those substantive changes to the intent or the purpose behind the rule. Again, if those things come up and we have other spaces where we're talking about that, we will direct you to the issues for further discussion um, and we'll talk through the, um, the uh, need for other meetings where that's, where that's um, coming up. Did we lose Nicolette? Yeah, looks like we did. All right. Hang tight here just a second. Oh, there she is. All right. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So roles and responsibilities for this, uh, for these meetings. Um, I'm Tiffany. Nicola is the one sharing her screen. She'll also be going over the actual rule changes. And then John Barry. Um, is helping to facilitate. We're doing introductions, monitoring of time, you know, making sure that we're moving the conversations forward, that we monitor any questions um, that are coming in and, and kick those over to our subject matter experts. So our subject matter experts currently are on the benefits and services teams. They'll be addressing verbal questions, concerns, and comments. Um, as they relate to the rule updates or any changes or guidance that um, we might need to give. And then we have our partners, HCBS Strategies. They are helping us with a lot of that back end. So they're doing record keeping for the listening logs. Um, they're helping us with uh, follow up and ensuring that that's happening in a timely manner and assisting with any questions um, that are in the queue. Next slide, please. So we currently have 392 lines of feedback, which has been so wonderful to get all of the questions. Really appreciate you, the time that you all take to give us this feedback. It is really, really important. Next slide. Again, here is the issues for further discussion. Um, I believe Nicolette has already put both of these in the chat, um, but. These are public documents. They are updated during the meeting by the HCBS team. And um, so you can, you can watch them being updated on our website as the meeting goes on. Um, and then we will be updating. So subject matter experts then take all of that, those comments back 
to their teams and to leadership and then respond in writing in those documents. Next slide, please. Some quick updates. So our chat will be copyable. We're asking that you please wait until the end of the meeting because our HICPUF staff will be monitoring for public health information. And if there is anything shared, we'll be deleting that as soon as possible. Um, again, we are working to update the logs in writing. We have a goal date of having all of that completed by mid-July before we put the full document together to be put into eClearance. And then quick follow-up to last week's meeting. So we had a really great meeting last Tuesday where uh, we talked about um, case management agency choice and cost containment. We're gonna continue that conversation on June 1st. I believe it's at 11 a.m. If it's not on the uh, stakeholder engagement um, calendar, then it will be shortly. We're gonna finish our cost containment conversation and then talk about case management agency training and tools and then case management agency quality oversight. Um, so I think with that, I will turn it over to Cassie for discussion about today's review. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Cassandra Keller. I am our community options benefits section manager and make sure you can still hear me, right? Everybody can hear me. Okay, I see Tiffany said. Um, really nice to be here with all of you. Uh, what, as the um, section manager, what that means is my teams oversee all of our home and community-based services. And that means all of the providers, uh, the provider requirements, the service definitions and the services um, under our home and community-based waivers. Um, is there one other slide? I guess I'll review what we're gonna go through today. These are going to be provider agency requirements. And the way that we've structured this is that, as you well know, there are provider requirement rules all over the place. They are spread through 8.4, 8.5, 8.6. Um, it's very disparate. And so what we have tried to do is really look at what is a requirement that is um, applicable to our case management, or excuse me, to our provider agencies across the board, regardless of what waiver you serve and what services you provide. So what we've done is um, we are looking at what are those rules that apply across the board, things like billing requirements, pol having policies and procedures, how you deal with personnel, um, all of that information is going to be within these provider agency requirements. And then as you move on to the services, we will talk about each of those services. And then what are the specific, we're calling them kind of provider credentialing requirements. So um, what does it take to specifically be a home modification provider or a personal care provider? So those specific credentialing requirements live within each of those services that they're specific to. Um, the provider agency requirements, again, are applicable to all of our HCBS services and providers. Um, so this is the list of kind of the areas that we have it broken out into. Next slide. So uh, as a warning, the, the document that you're gonna see is, is pretty blue. Um, and, and I know that looks a little overwhelming. It is kind of indicative of lots of substantial changes. The reason is, is that we wanted it to be clear that while not necessarily all of these things are policy changes, what we've done is we have pulled things from all over the place. Something that we really liked in the brain injury waivers um, provider requirements for our, let's say, uh, independent living skills training. We liked where that came from and we pulled that into this section of the rule. We took things that were applicable only to our program approved service agencies and we pulled that and put it into here. And so it's even more than just a restructuring. You know, we smashed together a lot of these rules where we thought this is great where incident reporting is described here, but we don't like this part. Let's pull this over here. And so that's the reason why it's so blue is that we're really just kind of smashing all of these things together. And, and where some of that policy change might take place is that something maybe that was only applicable to our um, IDD providers is now applicable to providers across the board. Um, so that's kind of what you're going to see. Hopefully this makes sense. What we've really tried to do is make it very clear what is required of a provider, regardless of who you're serving, 
and then you can kind of go into those specific areas of the services that you're rendering. But don't be too overwhelmed by all of this blue. It's more the fact that it's a mashup and we weren't really sure what color best applied. So we went with blue. So with that, I will, I think, hand it back over to Nicolette as we go through the rules. Hello, everybody. I'm going to be reading through the rules for you all today, and we'll kind of take it section by section and um, pause for questions in between. So whenever you see blue, or if you're not able to see blue, you'll see a couple of these backslashes. Those are the areas that we'll be reading. And I'll also be reading in between the braces, anything that you may see in green. Um, that's combined, moved, or similar language. Um, anything that you see in red is just an outdated reference to be updated. Um, and anything that you see the red line through, that's just something that we are taking out. So I will get started. And then we don't read anything in black because there's no changes there. So our first, whoops. Right. Um, and Nicolette, I guess what I would say about definitions is we've really, sorry to, to just bump in. Um, we're using all of the um, definitions that you have gone over as part of the case management redesign portions. We are using those same definitions. So I think that's why those are, are black is that we've, you have hashed through these things and they are not new. Um, they are either changed because they're what you all have decided on or they're an existing one. Thank you. All right, our first section to review today is enrollment standards. Enrollment standards, A, provider agencies must, one, conform to all state established standards for the specific services they provide under this program. Two, abide by all the terms of their provider participation agreement with the department and Three, comply with all federal and state statutory and regulatory requirements. This includes, but is not limited to, compliance with the 10 CCR 2505-10, and then these older sections of the rule, and regulations pertaining to the specific services rendered by the provider agency. That one was super short, so we'll just go through provider certification, decertification, and termination. A certification one. Prior to enrolling to the prior to enrolling to provide, providing, or billing for services that require certification, provider agencies shall obtain such certification. Two. A provider agency seeking certification as an HCBS provider shall submit a written request to the department or its agent. Three, upon receipt of the written request, the department or its agent shall forward certification information and relevant state application forms to the requesting agency. Four, upon receipt of the completed application from the requesting agency, the department or its agent shall review the information and complete an on-site review of the agency. Based on the state regulations for the service for which certification has been requested. Five, following completion of the on-site review with the department or its agent shall notify the provider agency applicant of its recommendation by forwarding the following information. A, results of the on-site survey. B, recommendation of approval, denial, or provisional approval of certification. And C, if appropriate, a corrective action plan to satisfy the requirements of a provisional approval. Six, determination of certification approval, provision, approval, or denial shall be made by the department after the completed application is submitted by the agency. Seven, provider agencies must notify the department of any material or substantial change in the information contained in the enrollment application given to the department by the provider agency. 
this notification must be made in the provider portal within 35 calendar days of the event triggering the reporting obligation. A material or substantial change includes a change in ownership, disclosure, licensure, federal tax identification number, bankruptcy, address, telephone number, or email address, criminal convictions under 42 CFR 455.106, or change in geographical service area. B, change in information. One, provider agency must notify the department within 35 calendar days of the loss or termination of certification and or licensure that is required for home and community-based service provider enrollment in accordance with section 8.130.45. The notification must be submitted through the provider portal, portal as a maintenance application to end date the specific, <clears throat> the special, good gracious, it's one of those, Speciality or disenrollment request. And C1, a provider may lose one or more of its certification and will no longer be able to bill for goods or services authorized by the certification or certifications if any of the following occur. A, the provider fails to comply with any federal or state statute rule or guidance. B, the provider fails to comply with any requests by the department or its agent. C, the provider is no longer eligible to provide the services allowed under the certification. D, the provider poses a threat to the health, safety, or welfare of Medicaid members. E, the provider will be sent written notice 30 calendar days prior to the <clears throat> decertification unless otherwise required by federal or state statute regulation or guidance. And then one notice will detail the reasons for decertification. Two, the notice will give the provider the opportunity to dispute the decertification. F, decertification may occur without prior notice if the decertification is imperatively necessary for the preservation of public health, safety, or welfare, and observance of this notice requirement would be contrary to the public interest. Within five business days of decertification, the provider shall receive notice. G, if the provider elects to dispute the decertification, the department must receive the provider's written request to dispute decertification within 30 calendar days of the date of the decertification notice. H, the department will review the request and issue a department on a determination on the decertification, which will include the provider's right to file an appeal in accordance with section 8.050. And where am I, sorry, I, the effective date of the inactive inactivation may be backdated to the date of the occurrence described above. D, termination of provider agreements. One, the department shall initiate termination of provider agreements pursuant to section 8.076. And we will pause there for any questions. Thank you, Nicolette. Again, this is John Barry. So Folks, you can uh, give me your name for the queue by raising your hand in the webinar. And just to remind you, it's a two-step process. There's your reaction button on the bottom. You click that and it will show you the button to raise your hand. You can type your name in the chat, John for the queue, for example. And I do know there's a couple people who look like they're on the phone only. So at this moment, if those folks who are just on the phone and can't give their name any other way would unmute, press star six. Give me your name. Okay, I'll be monitoring this. Looks like we have a couple people. Christy, you're up first. You have two minutes. Thanks, Christy. Great. I have a, um, a number of thoughts and suggestions for this area. 
Um, so I'm not seeing any timelines or due dates here for the department to review or respond to requests for applications. Um, and so I think it would be helpful for provider agencies to know when they can expect um, these applications to be processed. On um, 8.7504C1B, um, I have some concern about the language that allows the decertification and defunding of an agency for not complying with any request by the department or, or its agents. And I'm wondering why the language in item A isn't sufficient to cover the obligation um, that provider ha providers have for agents op operations. And then 8.7504C1E2 or II, um, the Administrative Procedures Act specifies that agencies um, afford licensees a reasonable opportunity to comply with lawful requirements and that agencies shall not revoke, suspend, annul, limit, or modify a previously issued license until after holding a hearing. Um, and so I think it's important in this section that the Administrative Procedures Act also be referenced as um, a basis for this rule. And then, um, oh, I think that's it for this section. Okay, thank you, Christy. Um, we did have someone else who had raised their hand, but it looked like they lowered their hand. Is there anyone else at this point? And I'm looking at the chat to see if someone has typed their name. Don't see it. Okay, here we are. Laura, please go ahead. Thank you. You have two minutes, Laura. Thank you. I wonder um, when I look through this section, if there is a way to incorporate how the case management agencies will be notified of either a certification or a decertification of a provider. Maybe that doesn't go in this section, um, but through my lens, that would be really helpful. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, this is Cassandra. I think that's a good catch, Laura, um, and, and something that we can certainly look at adding because I think there does need to be that feedback loop. I know there's a distinction between how program approved service agencies um, historically have communicated versus those providers of non-IDD services. So we will take a look at that piece. Great, thank you. Thank you, Laura. This is John. Is there anyone else for the queue at this point? Again, raising your hand in the webinar, typing your name in the chat. You're on the phone only, you can unmute. Okay, Betty, please go ahead. You have two minutes, thank you. I just wanted to reiterate what Kristen had said about not having any detail in here about a provide for a provider about how long it can take the department to respond. And I see this as sort of like a pattern that there's lots of dates and timelines for people who are applying to the department but there's on the expectation side of a person who's in business, who's trying to do business with the department, there's no indication in the rules about how long the department has to respond to them. Is it a year? Is it 10 years? Is it three weeks? Is it? So I just wanted to reiterate, wherever this comes about, where there's a notice to people who are applying to the department, there has to be a responding timeline by the department so that people understand what the parameters are. So I just see this as a recurring problem. Thank you. Thanks for that, Betty. We'll take that back to the team who um, is working on these rules. Appreciate your feedback. This is John, we'll move forward at this point. Okay, now we're going to start with change of ownership. Change of ownership. A, provider agencies that possess certification and or licensure from the Department of Public Health and Environment must complete the CDPHE change of ownership, CHOW process current concurrent to the initiation of the chow process 
with the department and its fiscal agent. B, a change of ownership resulting in a change of federal employer identification number, EIN, determination or terminates the provider participant agreement. The new owners must reapply with the new EIN, submitting a new enrollment application through the provider enrollment portal that includes the selling provider's information and a new provider participant agreement. The change of ownership enrollment application cannot be processed for approval until the selling provider completes and submits a voluntary disenrollment request through the provider web portal. One, the new member shall not automatically become a Medicaid provider without meeting licensing certification and approval process standards. Did we wanna keep on going since that was a short one or pause? Maybe we'll just keep going to determination. A, all provider agencies must document services rendered and retain re records pursuant to section 8.130. B, documentation of services pro of service provided must include one, location of service provided, two, time and date service was provided, including beginning and end time. Three, name of individual rendering services. Four, exact nature of the specific tax, tasks performed and documentation of any changes in the member's condition or needs and action taken as a result of the changes. And five, units of service provided. Six, for per diem services, documentation of services rendered must include seven, medication administration record, MAR, if applicable, eight, daily attendance tracker, nine, weekly notes at minimum should include A, activities member participated in, B, appointments if applicable, and C, respite services or overnight stays elsewhere, if applicable. And then we will pause here for any questions or comments. Okay, folks, this is John again. If you have a comment or question, you can raise your hand in the webinar. You can type your name in the chat at this point. And again, for those you people who are on the phone only, if you unmute and give me your name. Any comments, any questions? Okay, Nicolette, seeing none, hearing none. All right, we will keep on moving. Insurance requirement. A. Provider agencies must maintain liability insurance in an amount sufficient to cover total bodily injury or property damage arising from a single incident. B, provider agencies managing personal needs funds shall purchase and maintain a surety bond in an amount specified by the department or provide an <clears throat> irre I'm so bad at, irrevocable letter of credit in the same amount made payable to the state to protect the personal needs of the member. C, provider agencies rendering reimbursable non-medical transportation, NMT, services must maintain liability insurance with the following automobile liability minimum limits. One, bodily injury. 300 to 600,000 per person per accident, and two, property damage, 50,000 or three, 500,000 combined single limit. D, drivers that utilize their personal vehicle on behalf of a provider agency to provide reimbursable NMT must maintain the following minimal autom automobile insurance limits in addition to the insurance maintained by the provider agency. 
one, bodily injury, 25 to 50,000 per person per accident, and two, property damage, 15,000. And let's see how big is our next section. Not very big, so we'll go over this next section as well. HCBS provider billing, 8.487.200 and 8.603.5.M, language included below. And then 8.130.60, 8.040, 8 8.043 are sections that may need to be referenced. A, payment to an enrolled Medicaid service provider will be made only if services are provided to an eligible member and claims are submitted in accordance with the following procedures. One, provider agencies shall verify member eligibility prior to delivering services. Two, provider agencies shall verify a prior authorization request, PAR, has been approved for the services in question to be provided to the eligible member prior to service provision and claim submission. Three, claims shall be submitted to the fiscal agent in accordance with department billing manuals and policies outlined in 10 CCR 2505-10, 8.043 and 8.040. Four, claims shall only be submitted for services and <clears throat> for services the provider is enrolled to provide, including correct HCBS specialties. Five, claims shall only be submitted for, service pro for services provided in accordance with all applicable federal and state statutes, regulations, and other authorities. Six, claims shall be filled out completely and correctly, and seven, payment shall not exceed department established limits as indicated on the rates slash fee schedule as published by the department. B, provider agencies shall not collect co-payments or seek reimbursement from eligible members for services when those services are reimbursable through HCBS waiver and or Health First Colorado. One, service services provided in conjunction with HCBS waiver, reimbursable services, and or Health First Colorado, reimbursable services that are not themselves reimbursable by any Medicaid program may be billed to the member. C, provider agencies or the service providers designated claim submitting an ent entity shall attend the department's billing training annually or by the request of the department. We will pause there for questions. Thanks, Nicolette. This is John again. If folks want to ask a question, give a comment, you can raise your hand in the webinar. A couple of people have done that so far. You can type your name in the chat. So I'll be monitoring the chat. Let's start with Christy. Thank you. You have two minutes. Okay, at 8.7508C1, I just want to clarify um, things that are not themselves reimbursable by any Medicaid program can be billed to, to the member. Does that include things like um, supplements that could potentially be prescribed by a physician or vitamins, over-the-counter medications? Um, because that question comes up pretty routinely. If, um, this is Cassandra, if it is not something that Medicaid will pay for, so if um, the pharmacy will not pay for it through Medicaid, then they could charge the member for it. So if it's not covered by Medicaid. And <clears throat> since this, issue, since this um, version of the draft has been published, we've actually made a few modifications to this piece to provide even more clarity on um, fees and additional charges that providers can um, charge. I know we issued a memo about that and there's been a lot of confusion, so we are trying to flush that out further. But again, if it is not something that is covered by Medicaid, either as a service or through the pharmacy or through like the DME, the durable medical equipment supplier, 
um, then that could be charged to the member. Hopefully that clarifies. Okay. And I just want to clarify, even if a physician is recommending it, mm -hmm. if it's not covered by Medicaid, Correct. there is not an obligation for the provider to so, pay for yes, that. That's correct. Okay. I mean, Cigna, you know, I've been prescribed an iron supplement and I go to take it to the pharmacy and Cigna says, nope, nope. So I think it's in that same way. If it is not covered by Medicaid, then it could be charged regardless if there's a physician order for it. Excellent. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks, Christy. Betty, you're next. You have two minutes, please. Thanks. Is there any process for the provider agency to talk to the member about how it's determined whether the things that they are using or have been ordered um, would be charged to the member in the event? I mean, the, I know we're talking in this section about provider agencies and Medicaid, but is there a drop down that says provider agencies must have some kind of a meeting of the minds with members so that they're clear about what the provider can and cannot um, submit as a claim? Yeah. Um, well, Betty, I, I think if I think I know what you're getting at, I think that's a fair point. So I think first, if you're saying what they submit as a claim in, into Medicaid, no, I don't think there is a conversation or agreement that needs to be had when it comes to what they submit as a reimbursable claim. Um, that's what's on the prior authorization. Now, if you're talking about, is there some kind of agreement that needs to take place with fees that can be charged? I don't know that even in my um, newest iteration of, of the rule draft that I address that. And I think that is a very fair and valid point that there needs to be some place in writing that says, you know, these supplements, this iron supplement prescribed by your provider is not covered by Medicaid and insurance. And therefore, you know, we are going to charge you X dollars for this. I think, you know, the expectation is that is, um, Put in like the for at least a residential provider like that's put in the resident agreement but i think it probably would be better to have that um even more fleshed out in here that the requirement is that there is that maybe not necessarily a meeting of the minds but that that is documented and it's agreed upon by all parties if that was getting at your point betty it, it does i i just okay. want to make sure that people aren't uh, coming with unreasonable expectations. Sure. They've had a talking to by the provider saying, this is what we can bill, this is what we can't bill. And that there's some kind of a rule that the provider does do that with the members so that the um, recognition of the problem doesn't happen as an afterthought, it's a forethought. Okay. I, I have one other question. Does this also apply to CHIP? Do these rules apply to CHIP at all? They do not. These are strictly for our home and community-based okay. providers. Okay, that's just curious. Okay, thank you. Now, I, I will just say, like as noted above, providers are obligated to follow this set of regulations in addition to anything that's outlined in 8.0, 8.1, 8.2 um, pertaining to providers as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, up next is Carrie. Carrie, you have two minutes. Thank you. Um, hi, I just had a question if there was going to be any kind of change to providers for um, such as providers who provide the integrative therapies, massage, chiropractic, and acupuncture, if there'll be any kind of change to being able to um, bill the participants um, late fees or cancellation fees for folks who you know have appointments, no call, no show, or late cancellations, or if that's still an unbillable thing through Medicaid. Um, those are still going to remain unbillable because it is for that covered service. So we, we are not able to charge Medicaid members enrollment fees, registration fees, late fees, things like that, unfortunately. Um, and, and again, uh, you know, we, we, this version or this document is a continual work in progress. And so we have that piece outlined, but we're trying to make it even more clear as we've gotten questions in since the issuance of our memo about fees of, you know, really particular about what kind of fees are allowed. Okay, thanks. Thank you all. So we're at the end of the queue for now, Nicola, thanks. 
Okay, we will move on to policies and procedures. A, a provider, oh, sorry, provider agencies must have policies and procedures for each of the items below. One, staffing and employment. A, provider agencies shall have written policies and procedures for recruiting, selecting, retaining and terminating employees and contractors. B, provider agencies shall establish qualifications for employees and contractors. Two, medication administration. A, provider agencies must have policies and procedures on the administration of medication, including gastrost gastrostomy services. B, provider agencies must have written policies and procedures for the appropriate procurement, storage, distribution, and disposal of medication. One, all drugs shall be stored under proper conditions of temperature and light and with regard for safety. Two, discontinued drugs, outdated drugs, and drugs and drug containers with worn, illegible, or missing labels shall be promptly disposed of in a safe manner. Three, a record shall be maintained of missing, destroyed, or contaminated medication. C, the use of medication reminder boxes shall be pursuant to section 25-1.5-303-1 in the CRS. Three, protected health information. A, provider agencies shall have written policies governing access to duplication and dissemination of information from the member's record in accordance with the CR with CRS section 26-1-114 as amended. Provider agencies shall have written policies and procedures for providing employees with member information needed to provide the services assigned with the agency policies for protect, protection of confidentiality. Four, mistreatment, abuse, neglect, and exploitation, 8.608.8. Pursuant to sections, <clears throat> excuse me, 25.5-10-221 CRS, provider agencies shall prohibit abuse, mistreatment, neglect, or exploitation of any member. B, provider agencies shall have written policies and procedures for handling cases of alleged or suspected abuse, mistreatment, neglect, or exploitation of any member. These policies and procedures must be consistent with state law and C, provide a mechanism for monitoring to detect instances of abuse, mistreatment, neglect, or exploitation. Monitoring is to include at minimum the review of one, incident reports, two, verbal and written reports of unusual or dramatic changes in behaviors of members, and three, verbal and written reports from members, advocates, families, guardians, and friends of members. D, provide procedures for reporting, reviewing, and investigating all allegations of abuse, mistreatment, neglect, or exploitation. E, Ensure that appropriate disciplinary actions up to and including termination and appropriate legal recourses are taken against employees and contractors who have engaged in abuse, mistreatment, neglect, or exploitation. F. Ensure that employees and contractors are made aware of applicable state law and agents agency policies and procedures related to abuse, mistreatment, neglect, and exploitation or exploitation. G, require immediate reporting when observed by employees and contractors according to the agency policy and procedures and the agency administrator or his or her designee. H, require, require sorry, starting to jumble now require reporting of allegations within 24 hours to a legally authorized representative 
and case management agency, and I provide necessary victim support. Five, protection of individual rights. A, all provider agencies shall have written policies and procedures concerning the exercise and protection of individual rights pursuant to Title 25.5, Article 10, CRS, and 10 CCR 2505-10-8.484. B, such policies and procedures shall at minimum ensure protection of the individual rights set forth in Section 8.484, subject to the rights modification process in Sections 8.4, 84.5. C, providers shall supply members with plain language explanation of their rights. Six, dispute resolution. A, provider agencies shall have procedures for resolution of disputes involving individuals. One, who are found not eligible or are no longer eligible for services or supports. Two, whose services or supports are to be terminated. Or three, whose services set forth in person-centered support plan are to be changed, reduced, or denied. B, the procedure shall contain an explanation of the process to be used by members, protective members, <laughs> prospective members, or legally authorized representatives in the event that they are dissatisfied with the decision or action of the provider agency. C, the dispute resolution procedures of the provider agency shall at minimum afford due process by providing for one, the opportunity of the parties to present information and evidence in support of their provisions and, um, and sorry, of their positions to an impartial decision maker. The impartial decision maker may be the director of the agency taking the action or their designee. The impartial decision maker shall not have been directly involved in the specific decision at issue. D, providers shall supply members with a plain language explanation of available dispute resolution procedures, along with outside agency contact information, including phone numbers for assistance and seven non-discrimination policies in 8.600.5.E. A, provider agencies shall have policies in place that prohibit discrimination and outline the agency's follow-up procedures to address any discrimina discriminatory act. Eight, grievance and complaints. A, Provider agencies shall have procedures setting forth a process for the timely resolution of grievances or complaints of members, prospective members, or legally authorized representatives as appropriate. Use of the grievance procedures shall not prejudice the future provisions of appropriate services or support. B, the grievance procedure shall at minimum include the following. One, who within the agency will receive grievances, two, that they will have a mechanism to receive them verbally and or in writing, and will have a staff record of any verbal grievances and or complaints. Three, identification of support persons to assist in the submission of a grievance. For an opportunity for the individuals to come together in order to attempt finding a mutual acceptable solution. Five, timelines for the resolution of the grievance. Six, consideration by the agency director or designee if the grievance cannot be resolved at a lower level. And uh, seven, no individual shall be <clears throat> coerced intimidated, threatened, or retaliated against because the individual has exercised his or her right to file a grievance or has participated in the grievance process. C, 
Providers shall supply members with plain language explanation of available grievance complaint procedures, along with outside agency contact information, including phone numbers for assistance. D, providers must allow grievance com grievances and complaints to be submitted anonymously and at any time, not subject to a deadline. And I know this one's a super long one, so maybe we can pause before we start on number nine, subtracting, subcontracting for questions. Thanks, Nicolette. This is John. And folks, when I, I think I forgot to mention when you uh, give a comment, if you can mention which specific line or, or section you're addressing, that would be great. So we're taking names for the queue. Have a couple. Three hands raised, it looks like. And um, also, you can also type your name in the chat. So I'll be monitoring for that. Christy, let's start with you. You have two minutes, please. Great. My first question in this section is why hasn't the department um, moved the eight, section 8.484 to this section as well? If we're talking about streamlining and making rules easier to use, um, essentially what the department has done is just written an entire new section and then referenced back to 484. And I would really like to see the department move um, 8.484 here. Um, and I do have some thoughts about where that can go. And, and I let Cassandra know that I would um, send her my thoughts and ideas in writing so we don't have to capture them all here. So that's one of them. Um, the other comment, another comment I have is at um, 8.75094E, Agencies have no mechanism or authority to ensure that appropriate legal recourse is taken. And so I'd like to see that language changed or removed. Um, certainly we have an obligation to follow mandatory reporting guidelines, but we have no way to ensure legal recourse. Um, it also seems like there should be a reference to um, the mandatory reporting statute somewhere in 8.7509. Thank you, Christy. We'll move on. Julie Miller, you are up next. You have two minutes, Julie, thanks. Thank you. Um, my comment, and this maybe is a question, I'm wondering, is there somewhere in here that addresses substance abuse, alcohol use um, with providers and contractors? Um, from my perspective, as a case management agency, we have actually experienced that, unfortunately, before. And we're told by the department there was really nothing that they could do as recourse. So I think it would be a great time to add something like that in um, that just spells out if you show up to a job and you're, you know, it's, I don't know, you'd have to figure out the right way to write it, but um, if you um, are <clears throat> under Julie, the influence or suspected, yes. Just on the, on the, on the point being that if you are a provider agency, a direct service provider, a subcontractor, that there be some kind of prohibition written in that you cannot use sub illegal substances or or even any um, substances on a job, okay. you should not show up intoxicated sure. to a job. And and if there is, there will be recourse by the department because mm -hmm. that was never included sure. in the past. And, and apparently there was nothing that you could so, be done. Yeah, I think what there is, is in terms of personnel, in terms of policies and procedures, I think there is outlining, you know, the requirements of an inf of employees and being an employee of one of the provider agencies. I don't think we specifically say you cannot be drunk on the job or be high on the job. Um, but what we have is that those provider agencies need to have those policies and procedures pertaining to employment. I think we can certainly look at how that how we could add something that says you can't use substances. I think it gets a little, a little tricky of, you know, how we might word it, but I, I think that's something that we could um, look at adding, but it yeah, would be I under the means... policies and procedures of the provider. And then I think it would, again, though it would be up to the recourse of that would be up to the provider agency of ensuring that, you know, if staff 
does it show too, up. Mm -hmm. Comes with contractors though. I'm not talking a provider agency, I'm talking contractors. So I think that maybe the department needs to consider including something that is requiring them to understand as part of their contract that they cannot show up to a job intoxicated. Or, yep, or if so, the yeah. department will have recourse. And I think we get to that a little bit here when we're talking about contracting, subcontracting. I know this often comes in in terms of post home providers being those subcontractors. So I think let's see if if this gets to it at all. Um, but we can look at what language might be able to be added about um, those about substance use. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. You're up next. You have two minutes, please. Thanks. Thanks, John. So. My question is, if I'm a member and I have a grievance and it's with my agency and all of the things where you're saying the agency cannot do this, providers cannot do this, but what if they do? What if they do coerce, intimidate, threaten, and retaliate because they've exercised their right and the only person you can go to is the head of that agency? Where does the department come in as um, an arbiter um, when there's bad actors at the agency level. Um, it, it's, there's no, we, as Julie just wrote, there's no protection for clients other than legislators. And that's crazy. The department should be offering a resource to members who are afraid. Um, they have felt intimidated or coerced. They don't know what's going on. They can't get plain language. You know, they're, where does the department stand on this? I mean, you're left at this point with the agency with whom you have a grievance against as being the highest authority over your situation. And that's just very unreasonable. There needs to be an opportunity to move it up without having to go to your legislator. Um, you can move it from the agency um, or the provider up to HICPUF who will be able to say, you know, this isn't this isn't right. You need some more training, whatever it might be. But you know, there has to be some kind of authority and Betty, Betty, you have fifteen seconds, please. Fifteen, thank you. Okay, I'm done. Do you have an answer? So, yeah, yes. I mean, I think these are these are fair points. I think. Um, you know, the department does not necessarily want to sit in the role of being the arbiter of things when there is an issue that a, a member is facing in terms of their provider agency. Our, our number one um, thing is to contact the health department. They, for their complaint intake, they are our oversight entity. We contract with them to be able to do that work. They will investigate in those, um, you know, and I, I, I do hear that I see Julie's comment that it doesn't always address the issues or it does not address the issues. But um, the fact is they need to be able to look into that complaint and, and help make a decision on that. Not all complaints are necessarily valid. I think that that is one thing is, you know, not to say that clients aren't right or members aren't, aren't right. I'm just saying that there is not always something that can be substantiated. So I think we can certainly look into what further into how this process looks in terms of um, complaints, but I, I don't think anyone wants, you know, me sitting in the room making the decision of whether, you know, what can happen. So I think, yes, we are the single Medicaid state agency, but I, I think what we'd like to see is, is that process of oversight actually happening, looking and investigating into that complaint, and then, um, kind of having that come to, to closure. Certainly by no means is the provider the end-all be-all, and if there is any kind of um, com concern about retaliation always come to the um, to the department. We can certainly look to address that. We can work with our partners over at the health department with that. Um, so uh, I'm not able to give you a good definitive answer here, I don't think, but it's certainly something we can look at as we continue to address the rules. Well, Cassandra, I'd like you sitting in the room. <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, well, no, I, think I mean, I want somebody sitting in the room sure. other than the people with whom I have a grievance. Sure. And and I get that. And I think that's, you know, we, we can agree with, you know, first you want to see if the issue can be addressed with a provider. 
If not, then I think, yes, then it can get elevated and it can go to the health department. It can come to, to HICPUF. But I think, you know, we'd like to see those issues addressed. And I think the majority of them can. The majority of them are fairly benign issues that, you know, you sit down at the table with the provider and they can be hashed out and, and folks can move forward. I think there's a very small percentage of those issues that where, you know, it's, it's, retaliation happening, law enforcement being involved, APS, all of those things. I think that is a much smaller percentage of the issues out there. Yeah, but they're egregious. We will. Sure. I mean, they may be small, but so, a small percentage, but they're me, life-threatening yeah. to people. Let me suggest that we move forward. I think, Betty, you've, you've made the point and, and we're going to be looking at it. So let's go to Nancy. Nancy, you're up next. You have two minutes, please. Okay, thank you, John. Cassandra, I wanted to see to where could healthcare policy and financing put something under staffing and employment subcontracting or direct service providers regarding how many people they can actually serve. We've often found that we have a direct service provider, contractor, employer, whatever you want to call them, who's serving five people in foster care three under residential services. Um, they have five people they're providing respite to. And so that becomes a huge concern um, because they're serving so many people at the same time. There's nothing outlined here regarding direct service providers, employers, or contractors. And really their influence over the people in services and even their guardians um, that we run into very consistently. We just had a meeting with all our provider agencies and these are concerns they're bringing up that they have no legal recourse against those providers serving way too many people. Um, that's the first point I wanted to bring up. And also under um, <clears throat> the mistreatment <clears throat> or main, excuse me, there's nothing about, as Betty pointed out, but nothing against retaliation uh, for the people in services or, and or their family members when they report um, mistreatment, abuse or, abuse or next exploitation. And really the language under there, it's not consistent. It says mistreatment, abuse, neglect, or Nancy, exploitation. Yes, sorry sir. to interrupt you. You have 15, 15 seconds, Nancy, sorry. Oh, okay. And if you could just make it all consistent, because in some places it says abuse, mistreatment, neglect, and exploitation. Mistreatment is the overarching umbrella of that. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, good points. I think... Um, you know, as part of the, uh, under the developmental disabilities waiver, under the residential um, habilitation regulations, we spent a good amount of time talking about when we made some revisions for how many individuals can a direct service provider provide, how many people can, can a host home provider provide services for. I think, you know, what we kind of came to conclusion of it, it would be very challenging to put a specific number we, we did for host homes of, of how many a host home provider can provide services for. But if you're talking about a, a DSP that's maybe in a staffed home and there's rotating staff, how many individuals can that one person serve? So I will say we struggled with really being able to put a number. But to that end, I think that there is definitely some merit to looking to add that to um, to take that piece that we've added there for the, those particular services here under subcontracting. And really what we have said is that it, it is a requirement of the PASA to work with that subcontractor to really evaluate what services are they providing, who are the individuals that they are providing services for, and can you meet the needs of all of those individuals? So I do think, you know, we, we should look at, can we take those provisions over here and add them here? Because I do think it's important to make sure that, um, the individuals providing those services actually have the means to be able to serve everyone that they claim they can. Okay, thank you, Nancy. This is John. So we will be moving forward. We're at the end of the queue. 
All right. Oh, look, there was only 9, 10, and 11 left. I probably could have just finished through those. Um, so we are on nine subcontracting. A, provider agencies may utilize the services of subcontractors at their discretion. If an agency does utilize subcontractors, it is responsible for vetting, training, monitoring, and taking corrective action with subcontractors. B, nothing in these regulations shall create any contractual relationship between any subcontractor of the provider agency and the department. 10, contingency planning, 8.519.11. One one point B point two point four. A provider agency shall have procedures in place that identify a contingency plan for now for how necessary support will be provided in the event that a member's caregiver or direct service provider is unavailable due to an emergency situation or unforeseen circumstance. 11, telehealth. A, provider agencies that provide HCBS telehealth shall have a policy as described at the above. And then we'll add that in. Um, so hopefully that kind of answered some of those subcontractor questions. We will move on to personnel. A. Employee records. One, the provider agency shall maintain records documenting the qualifications and training of employees and contractors who provide services pursuant to these rules and regulations. Two, provider agencies shall maintain a personnel record for each employee or contractor. The record shall contain at least the following. A, documentation of employee contractor qualifications, B, documentation of training, C, documentation of service supervision and performance evaluation, D, sorry, I have my, something that just caught my throat, I'm so sorry, D, documentation that the employee contractor was informed of all policies and procedures required by these rules. E, a copy of the employee contractor's job description. B, license and certification. One, provider agencies must meet the enrollment requirements for each service it provides. This includes the responsibility for ensuring each employer or subcontractor maintains the necessary and appropriate license and or certification to render services. The provider agency is responsible for maintaining records with current and valid licenses and, certi <clears throat> and certifications. C, medication administration, one. All employees and contractors not otherwise authorized by law to administer, medi administer medication who assists in or monitors member in the administration of medications or a fulfilling medication reminder system shall have passed a competency evaluation offered by an approved training entity as defined in 6 CCR 1011-1, Chapter 24, and D, trainings. Provider 1, provider agencies shall have an organized program of orientation and training of sufficient scope for employees and subcontractors to carry out their duties and responsibilities efficiently, effectively, and <clears throat> competently. The training program shall at minimum provide and include the following. A, training to be provided prior to employees or subcontractors having unsupervised contact with members. B, training related to person-centered practices, the role of the person-centered support plan, and the concept of dignity of risk. C, training related to health, safety, and services and supports be provided and related to the specific need and diagnosis of D, members served. E, training specific to the individuals 
for whom the employees or subcontractors will be providing services and supports, and F, provider agencies, programmatic policies, and procedures. Do we want to keep going? Or are we going to keep? Are we good? All right, I'll get through. Let's see how much more do we have actually? Yeah, I'll finish this section. Okay, E, CAPS and BGC. One, provider agencies may conduct background checks and reference checks prior to employing staff or subcontractors providing support and services to members. A provider shall not employ a person convicted of an offense that could pose a risk to the health, safety, and welfare of members. All costs related <clears throat> to obtaining a criminal background check shall be borne by the provider. Two, provider agencies must comply with the Colorado Adult Protected protection services caps requirements outlined in statute. The agency must maintain accurate record and make record available to the department upon request. A, direct service provider means any person providing direct services and supports, including case management services, protective services, physical care, mental health services, or any other services necessary for at-risk adult health, safety, or welfare pursuant to statute. Direct services, direct service providers include provider agency applicants and owners as they are ultimately responsible for the members they serve. During the enrollment process, the provider agency may be granted provisional approval to render medical Medicaid services. Final agency approval is contingent on submission of documentation of a complete CAPS check on the agency applicate, applicant and the owner within 90 days from the receipt of the provisional approval. One, failure to submit the required documentation within 90 days of the provisional approval period may result in Oh my goodness. Rescindment. I'm like seriously really bad at those that go together. I'm so sorry. Rescindment of the provisional approval. Two, for the purpose of the statute, the Department of Healthcare Policy and Finance and Financing is the oversight agency for provider agencies and must be informed of CAPS checks results for employers who run them on themselves. C, direct service and backup providers with any of the following are prohibited from providing direct care to any members. An allegation of abuse, neglect, exploitation, or harmful act as defined in the statute substantiated by Adult Protective Services, APS, within the last 10 years at a severity level of moderate or severe as defined in the section of the statute. Two, three or more allegations of abuse, neglect, exploitation, or harmful act as defined in the statute substantiated by APS within the last five years at the minor severity level as defined in statute. Three, a criminal conviction of abuse, neglect, or exploitation against an at-risk adult with intellectual and developmental disabilities as defined in the statute. And four, only substantiated <clears throat> allegations that have exhausted the appeal period and come to a final disposition as defined in the statute shall be included in the above exclusions list. And then um, Cassie has something that she would like to add. Um, thanks. Thanks, Nicolette. I think the one thing I would just want to say about this piece is this is probably a little more of one of those true blue areas where we're talking about um, this, this section of the rule pertaining to background checks, CAPS checks, the Colorado Adult Protective Systems checks, and then 
who can be prohibited for, from, from providing care. I just want to point out, this is a set of rules. Uh, this portion came from our um, IDD regulations for our residential habilitation service. And so this section, while it, it is now going to apply to all service providers, has been vetted. We have gone and worked extensively with our friends over at the Colorado Department of Human Services and their adult protective services section, really looking through how do we ensure um, due process for individuals who have maybe a pending uh, claim or um, allegation against them. And so um, these pieces, and, and I see Julie, yes, we can make clear that this, this portion does not, not apply to consumer directed attendant support services. Um, but this is going to be for all of those other providers, but we have really vetted this piece. And so um, while it is going to be new to uh, a lot of our service providers, it is not necessarily new to, to some of them. So I just wanted to point that out there. Um, I, I, again, I know this is going to be a bit of a shift for some of our providers, but we really worked hard to make sure that this kind of rule is going to work and that it it is fair and really looks at um, the type of allegations and, and the severity and the frequency, not just one and done and you can't provide services. So I, I see we have a couple of hand raised. I'll hand it back over to you, John. Thank you, Cassandra. So uh, we are taking uh, comments and questions, hands for the queue for the section that Nicolette and then Cassandra just went over. So I'm seeing a few hands. You can also type your name in the chat. Most people have been using the raise hand function, which is really helpful. Okay, we have three folks. Um, let's start with someone we haven't heard from since we're a little further in the meeting. Ellen, please go ahead and then we'll get to you, Christy. All right, good morning. Thanks, John, and um, thanks. Cassie and Hickpa for the opportunity. I actually wanted to make just a general comment um, or inquiry rather than digging into this specific section. Um, it strikes me as we're going through this that this is a case management redesign meeting, and but we're talking about provider qualifications for all HCBS. And so I feel like there are probably a lot of provider agencies out there who weren't necessarily aware that this specific rule was going to be discussed in the context of case management redesign and may not be participating in today's meeting because they felt like it was specific to case management or CMA provider qualifications specifically. And so I'm wondering if HICPUP is planning to do another round of stakeholder engagement sort of advertised to that larger set of HCBS providers um, so that they're aware before this goes to the medical services board that there are some pretty um, substantial changes being made that will impact them. Thank you. Hi, Ellen. Thank you for that comment. I appreciate it. Um, this, this has been advertised to the broader OCL community with um, specifically calling out that we are going to be reviewing um, provider rules. Um, I think we'll have to talk with uh, Cassandra and her team about their plans for the rule revisions and if there's further engagement that they will be doing. Um, at, at this point, um, that is that is not in our plan, um, but we'll take that under consideration and, and appreciate that insight. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. So we will go to Christy. Christy, you're up next. You have two minutes, please. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, in 8.750910 contingency planning, I think the language should say um, supports identified and agreed to in the service plan and not necessary supports because that seems to kind of open it up that a provider is on the hook to provide whatever the person might need versus what the provider has agreed to provide um, through the service plan. So I think that clarification is necessary. Um, and then, I, and this is just sort of um, probably just a typo, but 8.75010D1D, I think the D1D should be a part of C and then subsequently correct um, how the, the rest of that list is enumerated. 
Um, and then a question 8.75010DF, what does programmatic mean? And would it make more sense or would it mean the same thing to say applicable instead of programmatic? And then also curious, my comment earlier about um, section 8.484 was a pretty big one and I didn't get a response from the department and I'm certainly hoping to hear some um, feedback about why we didn't take 8.484 and move it over here. Um, I don't think there's, I, I think that piece is still up for discussion. I think we're still trying to figure out exactly how all of this is going to work. I think um, as Tiffany alluded to, this is a, a huge thing we are moving and, and reformatting all of the way the services are done as well. So I don't know if we make 8.7 um, the, the largest rule in, in history and put all of those things there. I think, you know, we have, we're looking at bringing telehealth over. I, I certainly think it makes sense to bring over what is in 8.4 in terms of the final settings rule, but at a minimum, you know, we are going to make sure that we are consistently citing to those appropriate locations where we're talking about the final settings rule and person-centered support planning and all of that. Um, but certainly it's, it's, it's on the table of how we, we get all of those rules together and have all of that applicable information in kind of one area. Yeah. Thank it, you. It, uh, to Nancy, we, you've had two minutes. We need to move, or Christy, I apologize. We need to move forward to Nancy. I'm being mindful of our time here. Thank you. Um, any further comments you can certainly put in the chat. Um, Nancy, you're up next. You have two minutes, please. Uh, Cassandra, under E, under CAPS, it says provider agencies may conduct back background checks and reference checks. Should it not say may, but shall? Yeah, um, someone else pointed that out as well, Nancy. I think we should have it as a, as a must there. So okay, thank well. you. And when it talks about background checks, um, maybe clarifying, I know our provider community has said, well, we don't, we don't know if we're supposed to just run federal or state or Colorado. What if sure. there's criminal background checks in another state they, they provided services to? So maybe a little bit clarification on that. Yeah, I think it, there's a bit of a challenge there. Like you said, there's a lot of different ways to run a background check. There's um, name-based background check, fingerprint background checks. I know fingerprints are oftentimes more of a challenge. They're certainly more costly. I think one that is up to the provider agency to determine what type of background check they want to run. I think what we are saying, and, and we will certainly correct the language, is that at a minimum, a provider needs to run one, whether that is a um, uh, state or a national one that is up to the provider, but at a minimum that background check and then that CAPS check needs to be run. And I know there are certainly some issues between the reporting and, and the communication between APS, and that is certainly something um, our state agencies are talking about between the HICPUF and the Department of Human Services in terms of how that information is communicated. There is a lot of statutory barriers to that, and I believe um, CDHS is working to address some of that and kind of open up what their abilities are in terms of uh, communication sharing. So hopefully that kind of addresses some of those oh. questions in the chat. John. Thanks, Cassie. And, and to Julie and folks, who I've been instructed, we are mindful of time. We need to move forward at this moment. But Julie, you do have the chat to enter a comment. So moving forward, Nicolette. OK. Rendering services according to the person-centered support plan. A, provider agencies shall maintain on-file copies of the current person-centered support plan for all members they serve. B, provider agencies must render services according to the person-centered support plan and coordinate with other provider agencies when applicable. Members receiving services shall be included in developing the person-centered support plan and have the freedom to choose the provider agency that best meets their needs. C, a provider agency shall not condition a member's 
receipt of any services on the member's agreement to receive other services from the provider. D, a provider agency shall not discontinue or refuse services to a member unless documented efforts have been made to resolve the situation that triggers such <clears throat> discontinuation or refusal to provide services. And then critical incident reporting. A, a critical incident means an actual or alleged event that creates the risk of serious harm to the health or welfare of a member. A critical incident may endanger or negatively impact the mental and or physical well-being of a member. Critical incidents include, but are not limited to, one, death, two, abuse, neglect, exploitation, three, serious injury to a member or illness of a member, four, damage or theft of a member's property, five, medication, mismanagement, six, loss or missing persons, and seven, criminal activity. B, a provider must submit a verbal or written report of every incident to the HCBS member's case management agency or CMA case manager within 24 hours of discovery of the actual or alleged incident. The report must include one, member's name, two, member's Medicaid identification number, three, waiver, four, incident type, five, date and time of the incident, six, location of the incident, seven, persons involved, eight, description of the incident, and nine, resolution if applicable. C, if any of the above information is not available within 24 hours of the incident and not reported to the CMA case manager, a follow-up to the initial report must be completed. D, additional follow-up Information may also be requested by the case manager or the department. A provider agency is required to submit all follow-up information within 24 hours from the time it was requested. Environmental standards for provider-owned or controlled settings. A, provider-owned or controlled settings are defined at 8.48 4.2, it's in the rule, <laughs> I'll just say that. This settings, these settings and the provider agencies that own or control them must comply with all of the environmental standards outlined below in addition to the requirements set forth in the rule. Number one, the physical facilities shall be inspected by the local fire authority prior to occupancy and at least once every three years thereafter. The local fire authority shall be informed of the purpose of the facility and potential mobility or ambulation needs of individuals served. If the, if the purpose of the facility changes in a way that impacts the individual to be served in that facility, then the service agency shall be responsible for informing the local fire authority to determine if another inspection is required. The service agency shall conduct fire drills at least quarterly at each physical facility. Three, all physical facilities shall have smoke detectors and fire extinguishers. Four, all physical facilities shall have first aid supplies available. Five, all service agencies shall comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, with the regards to physical facilities. B, physical facilities shall meet all applicable fire, building, license, and regulation. And let's see. Are we going to stop here? I'm trying to see if I have any. Okay. We can stop here for questions and try to get through okay. the rest before the end. Okay, thank you, Nicolette. So this is John. I do wanna point out to the group, we are very mindful of our time right now. We're running short. So I'm going to ask people to stick with the time limits and make a comment, and we're not gonna be doing back and forth things simply because of time. So please put your name in if you have a comment or question about what Nicolette just went over. One so far, I'll be monitoring for other hands raised. 
and I may need to call time on those. Betty, go ahead, please. You have two minutes. Thank you, John. Will we have any kind of rule for the providers when they can't, for the agencies, when they can't find providers? What happens now is they say, I'm sorry, we can't rent, give you any services because we can't find any providers. Have a nice life. Betty, are you talking about for case management agencies? Yes. I mean, for anybody, it's there is a shortage of providers. People, the case management agency has some responsibility to get a client into services, but it's, they can't because they can't find any providers. And so what happens now is that the clients say, well, where do I go now? What do I do now? And they go, we don't know. We don't have any rules about that. Okay, thanks for that comment, Betty. Um, I think that might pertain more to the case management rules for, for when there's not provider capacity. Um, so I will take that back to the case management team and we will work on next steps for that. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. So Nicolette, seeing no other names right now, I'm suggesting we move forward. Perfect. All right, we will move to room and board. A, effective January 1st of each year, the department shall establish a uniform room and board payment for all Medicaid members receiving residential HCBS. This includes one, alternative care facility, two, supported living program, three, transitional living program, four, individual residential service and support, five, group residential service and support, six, children's habilitation residential program out of home residential settings. B, the standard room and board amount may not exceed an amount equal to the monthly benefit for supplementary security income, SSI, less an amount specified by the department for personal needs. C, Provider agencies shall not charge a Medicaid member more than the department's annually established room and board rate. The room and board rate shall include, but is not limited to, basic furniture such as bed, dresser, and a nightstand, linens, utilities, and basic toiletries to include toilet paper, soap, tissues, shampoo, toothpaste, and toothbrush. Medication administration. A. Provider agencies shall provide sufficient support to members in the use of prescription and non-prescription medications to provide the health and safety of members. Decisions concerning the type and level of support provided shall be based on the abilities and needs of the members as determined by assessment and shall be in compliance with these rules. All medications shall be administered only by the person as authorized by law. One, no prescription medication shall be administered without a written order by a licensed physician or dentist. The drug regimen of each member who takes the prescription medication shall be reviewed and evaluated by a licensed physician, no less often than annually and more frequently if recommended by the physician or required by law. Two, refusals to take medications by a member and drug reaction shall be recorded. Ongoing refusals to take medication shall be addressed by the person's physician. Three, for members who are not independent in the administration of their own medications, the following shall be required. A, a written record of medications, including time and the amount of medication taken by the member, and B, physician order for over-the-counter medication. Four, for members who are independent in the administration of medications and who do not require monitoring each time medication is taken, the service agency shall provide sufficient at minimum quarterly monitoring or review of medications to determine that medications are taken correctly. Five, provider agencies or provider assistance with medication administration is a rights modification if the individual intake <coughs> indicate that they would prefer to handle such tasks on their own. B, psychotropic medications. One, psychotropic medication for members and support shall be used only for diagnosed psychiatric disorders and one, 
when the specific psychiatric evaluation or consultation has resulted in the recommendation for use of medication. Two, when the person-centered support plan speci specifies the use of psychotropic medication and a comprehensive review of the person's life situation and person-centered support plan has been completed. The person-centered support plan shall explain the specific methodologies, strategies, or procedures that will be implemented to assist the person to maintain stability or that they will be <clears throat> implemented in a crisis. Three, after informed consent of the member or legally authorized representative has been attain, obtained or pursuant to a valid court order. And four, when reviewing, when reviewed by the Human Rights Community, HRC, if committee, HRC, if the member is participating in a waiver for which HRC review is applicable. C. Administration of psychotropic medications to a member receiving residential services and supports shall, one, be authorized through a time-limited prescription of no more than 90 days by a fully licensed medical professional or psychologist and reviewed at least annually by a physician. Two, be administered per prescriber's orders. Three, ensure employees and contractors are knowledgeable of potential side effects and adverse reactions to the drugs. Four, include regular monitoring of the members for side effects. Five, include documentation of the effects of medications and any changes in medications. And six, not be ordered on a PRN or as needed basis. D, gastrostomy services. Gastrostomy services is the ingestion of food or administration of the medications through gastroostomy tubes or nasogastric tubes. Two, licensed group residential services and supports settings must comply with all applicable regulations under the statute for administration of gastrostomy services. Three, gastrostomy services shall not be administered by an unlicensed individual unless that individual is trained and supervised by a licensed physician, nurse, or other practitioner. Four, the provider agency shall ensure that a physician license Nurse, licensed nurse or other practitioner has developed a written individualized gastrostomy service protocol for each member requiring such services and that the protocol is updated each time the orders change for that member's gastrostomy services. Five, the provider agency shall ensure that a physician, licensed nurse, or other practitioner provides training to any unlicensed individual who may provide gastrostomy services. Determination of initial and any subsequent training shall be kept in the member's record. Six, the provider agency shall ensure that the physician, licensed nurse, or practitioner observes the document the unlicensed individuals performing the gastrostomy services and, document, and documents the said monitoring in the record of the members receiving gastrostomy services. And lastly, we have the organized healthcare delivery system, OHCDS. A, Organized Healthcare Delivery System, OHCDS, means a case management agency, CMA, that contracts with other qualified providers to furnish services authorized in any of the home and community-based service waivers. The OHCDS is the Medicaid provider of record for a member whose services are delivered through the OHCDS and is responsible for ensuring contracted providers are qualified and provide appropriate and approved services. As the OHCDS case management agencies will be responsible for the purchase of specified goods and services as specified by the department. When willing and qualified service providers are not available in the CMA's designated service area, the CMA will act as the OHCDS 
for the following services. One, assistive technology. Two, specialized medical equipment and supplies. Three, vehicle modification. Four, vision. Five, recreational equipment, fees, and passes. Six, hypotherapy. C, the CMA must enroll with the department for the corresponding provider specialties and will submit claims for reimbursement based on approved prior authorization request. The CMA will verify that the subcontractors and vendors meet all, oh, meet and continue to meet all provider credentialing requirements as outlined in the provider enrollment information. E, the CMA must have a purchase agreement with the vendors used for the purchase of goods and services. The two include, but not limited to, devices, recreational equipment, and passes, the medical equipment and supplies. F, the CMA must document attempts to find two bids where possible for vehicle modification. G, the CMA must ensure the purchase of goods is done with a fair market value. H, the CMA must put place processes and procedures yeah, sorry, to mitigate conflict of interest or personal gain by the case manager when purchasing goods or services for the service outlined above. And I, the CMA may not apply fees to any claim for the services listed above. And lastly, we have telehealth. A, provider agencies that choose to use HCBS telehealth must comply with all regulations and statute. We are ready for questions and comments. Okay, thanks, Nagolette. Great job, by the way. Um, I, we, I'm told we need to stop at 1055 or so. So I see we have two names in the queue, Christy and Emily. I would ask if you can Make your comment in one minute. That would really help each of you to allow time for the other. Let's start with Christy. Yeah, Go ahead, um, quickly, a, just a general point of frustration that we didn't spend two hours today um, sharing our comments and discussing them. At least half of the time was spent having the rules read to us. And so I think it significantly diminishes the opportunity we have for um, this really significant and important discussion. And so I just wanted to share that concern. Um, also 8.75016B um, on the last sentence, is this meant to be permissive or required? Because it says the CMA may will, so may they act or will they act? I think we need some uh, language clarification there. Sorry, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, I was just taking a look. They will act, um, apologies. I think there was some confusion when we were making the draft. It is a will. And, and should it be shall or must, um, must. versus will? It should be a must. So they they are going to be required to be that um, OHCBS. Okay, thank you, Christy. I will move us to Emily. Emily, thank you very much. I think this is the last comments of the day. Hi, thanks everybody. I, I'll try to just keep this quick. I just wanted to make a comment on um, the 0.75016 for organized healthcare delivery system. Um, I know there's the six services that are listed there, but one that's not listed is um, non-medical transportation, which our agency is currently trying to figure out how we're going to navigate that with um, purchasing or with making sure that individuals have access to public transportation options. Um, we were told to go to Intelleride, but Intelleride came back and said they weren't taking on new agencies at the moment. And so I know we're also talking with Janelle Poulier, um, but I just thought I'd mention it here as like, yep. would there be an option to include that at least temporarily to help ensure that there's continuity of service for that particular item? Yeah, uh, thanks, Emily. I think we will look to, this is still a draft set of rules uh, and draft set of services. I think we're going to try and um, get things through and tell right instead, but certainly understand your frustration and. and people getting services. So thanks. 
Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your feedback. We will be, again, taking all of this back to the teams working on these drafts and working on this process. And uh, the next meeting will be in two weeks, um, which is the 30th of May. Same time, same place. So 9 a.m. Um, at this uh, particular Zoom meeting, we'll keep this link. Um, so we will see you all in two weeks. I hope you have a great week. We'll also stay on for just a minute for anyone who wants to copy the chat, you may. And then we'll close out the meeting. Thanks again, everyone. Hello. All right. Thank you, everybody. Hope you all had enough time to copy and we're going to be leaving. Have a great day.